Good morning. I'm Raj Mundra, and I'm a visiting faculty member at ASB this year. Be the change. Such a simple phrase with infinite implications. Shaheen Mistry, founder of Akanksha and current CEO for Teach for India, is the embodiment of someone who had an experience that moved her at a young age, envisioned a powerful idea, pursued her vision with courage and passion, strategically built a network, and now is a leader in transforming education in India. She was willing to take a risk. Growing up, Shaheen went to 10 different schools in five countries. However, it was a visit to her grandmother's place in Mumbai after her first year in college when Shaheen looked for volunteer opportunities to work within Mumbai, to work with children. Visits to Mumbai slums made the wide gap between the rich and poor very apparent. Speaking only English, Shaheen befriend, befriended a Hindi-speaking girl so that each of them could learn a new language. Often children from nearby slums would listen in to their conversations, and over the next months, their sessions became regular evening classes. Shaheen left her studies as a college student in the United States and enrolled as a student at the University of Mumbai. She then recruited her friends to help with the initial efforts to provide an after-school program for these children. Leader of Tomorrow, an Ashoka Fellow, and recently a TED India Fellow, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Shaheen Mistry. Thanks, Raj. Uh, it's, it's ironic, when I wrote this title, I didn't realize that I would stand here and be so inspired way before I started talking. Thank both of you so much for, for your talk, and thank you, William, wherever you are as well. I want to start with two stories that speak a little bit to why I do what I do. And the first story is the story of an actual nameless boy. About two years ago, I was dropping a funding proposal off um, at a funder's home, and the watchman at the gate stopped me, and he said, Didi, Didi, you're the one that works with poor children. Come with me. There's a child that needs help. And I was getting a little bit late to go to the office, and I was in two minds, and he said, no, Didi, really, this child needs help. And so we went a block down the road, and there was a 12-year-old child who looked very, very, very sick. And I spoke to him, and I said, do you want to go to the hospital? And he didn't even have enough breath, but he said no. And I put him into a taxi anyway, took him to a, a local hospital. He collapsed in the bathroom, completely messed himself up, didn't have anybody in the world, admitted him into the hospital, and left an hour later. On my way back to the office, they called me from the hospital to say that he had died. I didn't even know his name. And the second story is more recent. It happened yesterday. I was in Hyderabad with the most incredible woman, TED speaker, Sunita Krishnan, who works on trafficking. And I was at one of her homes where she rescues child prostitutes. And she told me a story about a 13-year-old girl that she rescued um, about two and a half years ago. And the girl was brought back and was so defiant, didn't say anything, wanted to go back, and they didn't understand why. And finally, they realized the reason why was because she had a seven-month-old baby that had got left behind during the rescue. And so they went back to rescue this child and found the child, blue, hidden in a water tank. I met the child yesterday. She's three years old now. She looks like a happy, healthy child. She's not healthy. She's HIV positive. But Sunita is now putting her into school and really changing her life. And so when I think about these stories, I think that every single child is so important and so precious, and yet we live in a world with so much inequity. If you think about what I do, and I'm going to read you this one very long sentence, 
We talk about individual child stories, and then we look at the whole. And when we look at the whole, it's frightening. In a country with 15% of kids out of school, dropout estimated at worst case 90%, the statistics are saying by class 10, 1 million schools, most of whom are far from delivering a quality education, 8 million teachers trapped in a system of rote learning, a bureaucracy that's not conducive to effective perf performance compounded by social problems caused by poverty. This goes on and on and on and on. How do you give kids a better education? And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about two initiatives that we are part of. And the first started about 20 years ago, which Raj spoke a little bit about. And I'm going to tell you this through a story using the art of the Agangsha kids. Long, long ago in the first Agangsha center, Didi brought a few children together and realized that they did not know about colors. So she and her friends walked in one day with activities, crayons, books, and lots of paper. For almost 20 years since that day, on every day, children have learned to shine, to first imagine where they could be, believe things could look different, and then to climb the steep steps to change their lives. The children got excited about learning, explored language and math, and began to see themselves and their world as special. They learned to respect things around them, to love all people. Something was changing inside each of them. They were developing their own styles, finding their potential, learning how to stand on their feet, getting ready for the world. Something around them was changing too. The world was seeing how beautiful they were. Didi saw them thinking and dreaming. Their future looked so bright. Didi smiled because she knew her children were finding their colors. It's been many, many, many small little miracles that have happened along the 20-year journey. The most important are the changes in the kids. Um, this is the same child. Her name's Parveen. On the left, you see her. She's three years old when I first met her and started teaching her um, in a slum in Cuff Parade. Uh, you can probably tell by her eyes, incredibly naughty um, little girl um, with never well-brushed hair. Um, and now today, you see her, um, this is about two years ago, but today she's actually in college, one of the best universities um, in Bombay. Um, she actually has a chance of moving her family, who today live in a 10 foot by 10 foot room, seven of them in that room. She actually has a chance of moving them out of poverty. The second story is a story about a teacher of ours called Caroline and her student, Salman. Um, we had a very interesting teachers meeting a few years ago where we told our teachers, today we're not going to do the regular teachers meeting. Go out onto the streets for three hours, find a child on the street, connect with them, and come back and tell us about it. And the teachers were all a little, oh my god, how are we going to do this? Will this really work? But three hours later, Caroline came back and she was very, very excited. And she said, Shaheen, I need to share first. And she told the story of this 12-year-old child called Salman, who she met, who was selling books at the Haji Ali signal. And this is an excerpt from the, the conversation that she actually had with this child. Caroline, what makes you happy? Salman, nothing. Caroline, what makes you sad? Salman, nothing. Caroline insisting now. 
Why do you want me to think about what is not happy? I am happy just the way I am. Nothing makes me sad. Caroline, don't you feel sad when people don't pay you money for the book, when they just whiz off in their cars? It's happened to him a few times. Salman, if I start feeling bad about such small things, I will keep feeling bad all my life. It's okay. That's the way some people are. I will recover the money by selling more books at a higher price. Caroline, what comes to your mind when you see rich people whiz by in their cars? Salman, what's there to feel about? They belong where they are, I where I am. You belong where you are. We all have our own places. We should be happy where we are. In fact, I feel I'm happier and luckier than them. They have such huge cars to take them to places, and yet they are always in a hurry. So much so that they keep honking even when the traffic signal is red. They also suffer from BP problems and are always very tensed up. I at least get to sleep well, and I'm at peace every night. The short version of the story is that Salman came into her center. He didn't know how to add two-digit numbers. That was three years ago. This year, he's sitting to give his 10th standard exam through the National Open School. I mean, that's, that's the power of what a child can do. So then a few years ago, I became more and more obsessed by this question of how do you reach more kids? There are the Salmans, there are, you know, the Parveens, but we're covering so few children in the context of India. And understanding how incredibly hard this work is and how long it takes, how many years and years of intervention and ups and downs it is, how do you really scale this to cover more children? And that led us to this, this idea of really borrowing from this incredibly successful model in the US called Teach for America and saying, how can we do this in India? Maybe what we really need to do is step back in a way and say that to solve India's most complex problem of educational inequity, we need to really build a leader, uh, build a movement of some of our best and brightest and most committed young leaders who can put their best and brightest and most committed minds together to say, how do we really do this at scale? And it was very, very hard for me to choose two examples that sort of symbolize our first cohort of fellows and what they're trying to do and the power of this movement. But I wanted to take you through a short, very well-known poem by Shel Silverstein that we introduced our fellows to on their first day um, when they joined us on, on May 4th, and then talk to you about how this is really a movement of finding colors. Um, the colors of every child that we work with, the colors of every fellow that goes through our program, and the colors of all of us that touch all of those people. And this is by Shel Silverstein. My skin is kind of sort of brownish, pinkish, yellowish, white. My eyes are grayish, bluish, green, but I'm told they look orange in the night. My hair is reddish, blondish, brown, but it's silver when it's wet. And all the colors I am inside have not been invented yet. This is one of our fellows. His name is Tarun, and he teaches in Pune. He used to be a young professional with Hindustan Lever, left that to come and teach full-time for two years in a school where his children, class three kids, are five grade levels below. They actually all tested at a lower kindergarten level um, when he, he came in. And you see this very funny little Excel excerpt here on the right. Um, one of the, the issues that our fellows face is that they're very resource constrained environments and they have a very, very tight Xerox budget. And so Tarun came up with this business model for a Xerox machine. And he said, you know what, I think if I do the math and I get Teach for India to buy a Xerox machine, give it to someone in the community, they rent it out after hours, but they give me free, free Xerox sheets for two years, 
we're actually going to break even. And, and these are the kinds of tiny, tiny, little, little solutions that we feel these young people are going to be able to come up with. And again, staying with Tarun for a minute, this was the classroom that he inherited. Um, it looks actually nicer here than it actually did. It's got an aluminum shed. And he walked in and he said, my kids can't study in a classroom like this. This is just really, really dismal. And so he went out, raised the money, got permission from the school, and that's the same classroom um, a month later. And what's incredible about it is not just that it's bright and cheerful, but he's actually painted an entire investment plan onto his walls. So he's got these kids who were never interested in learning, now looking at the wall of books where their targets for the number of books that they need to read are, and the little characters that are going to take them through the fun land of math, etc. Um, that's just one, one example of, of our 87 fellows, all of whom are doing incredible things. And the next example I want to give you is sort of on the personal transformation side. So there's two things that we're asking of our fellows, to have incredible impact in these classrooms, but also to change themselves in the process. And a few months after Gaurav Singh started teaching, he actually read out a poem that he wrote literally in five minutes at the last retreat that we had. And I think it speaks to this idea of personal transformation. And the poem is called, Will I Ever? Will I ever change the world? Will I ever change the nation? Will I ever change the start? Will I ever change the destination? Will I ever change thinking? Will I ever change feeling? Will I ever change hurt? Or will I ever change healing? Will I ever change the truth? Will I ever change a lie? Will I ever change the earth? Or will I ever change the sky? Will I ever change the answer? Will I ever change the call? Will I ever change one? Will I ever change all? Will I ever change happiness? Will I ever change sorrow? Will I ever change today? Will I ever change tomorrow? I do not know if I will change the lowest low or the highest high, but I do know that one day I will change I. I wanted to end with a few things that I've learned on my most privileged journey over the last 20 years. The first is, I learned quite randomly, I got one of these mass emails that a friend had circulated, and it, it had a slogan on it. And the slogan was, why not is the mark of an interesting life. And somehow it really hit me. Why not is the mark of an interesting life. And I think the reason it hit me was because my whole life I'd been asking why. You know, why is the world like this? And why are so many kids not educated? And why aren't people doing more? And I realized that when you take a why and you flip it and make it into a why not, it's an incredible call to action and it's very, very empowering. It really changed the way that I looked at the world. The second is the symbol of our incredible lotus flower in India. And I, I don't know how many of you know this, most of you probably do, but a lotus flower always grows in a muddy pond. And yet, when you look at the pond, you don't see the mud. You always see the lotus flower. And so for us, through our work, that's been an incredible symbol of the fact that beauty is always more powerful than dirt in the same way that truth is more powerful than lies. And good has to be more powerful than evil. And so we use this as an example. And the third is this idea of be the change. I want to tell you one very quick story. Um, uh, my biggest mentor is a very simple man called Jayesh Bhai. And we'd taken a group of children to his ashram. And on the first day, the kids threw their shoes everywhere and went in. And Jayesh Bhai just quietly arranged them in a line, didn't say anything. Next afternoon, same thing happened. Kids threw their shoes. Again, Jayesh Bhai arranged them in a line. Nobody said anything to the kids. Third morning, kids walked into the room, and we noticed that the kids had arranged all their shoes in a very, very straight line. How incredible 
the power of just doing something yourself. I think that's been one of our biggest learnings. And finally, this is a child who we lost, uh, an Akanksha child, a year ago. He died very suddenly. And the day after he died, I was in his home in the slum, and he lived with his grandfather. And he had three months ago got his grandfather to stop working because his grandfather was old, and, and he was very, very fond of his grandfather. And his grandfather said, Lati, if you're very, very sick, he took 14,000 rupees out of a trunk and put it in Latif's hand and said, take this money, it's my earnings, go to a private hospital, Latif, don't go to a government hospital, you're not well. And Latif, without telling anybody, took that money, put it back into the trunk because he didn't want his grandfather to go back to work and went and died 12 hours later in a government hospital. And this said to me, in, in all my years where everyone thinks I've had this opportunity to give so much, I didn't have a clue of what it truly meant to give until I heard Latif's story. Um, the power of being able to give, the power of being able to lead by example, the privilege of learning so much from the people that I, that I have had the privilege to learn from um, have all been my moments of inspiration. Thank you. back on stage. Oh, okay, yeah. sorry. Mm -hmm. I've got a... uh, I have... Uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, for you. Um, you know, as you know, at our school, we have so many uh, children, teachers, and parents who have an international perspective, um, the truly global citizens uh, within this room. So I'd like to hear from you, why is it important for people um, who have international perspectives, who may be in Mumbai for shorter periods of time or longer periods of time, why is it important for them to become involved in the local communities within Mumbai? Um, so uh, this may not be the correct way to, to answer the question, but I actually think that the reason to do things for other people um, is it's really, it's really about doing something for yourself. Um, so I think you do bring a lot, and I think each one of us can contribute a lot, but my learning has been that you can't contribute anywhere near as much as you actually get back. So approaching it from a viewpoint of, I'm here, I'm in India, this is going to give me a much deeper insight into this country and what it can teach me. Um, and I'm going to learn so much from the people around me. I think that would be my reason to do it. Um, and one, one last question. You know, many of our students worked with, uh, work with Akanksha students. And in fact, last week, about 40 eighth graders visited Akanksha centers around Mumbai. Many of them were moved to become more involved. And so do you have any words of advice for them or other students who'd like to get involved? Yeah, um, I think just do as, as much as you can do. And, and I would put what you can do into sort of two broad buckets. Um, one is as much time as you can give. Because I think physical time spent with the kids, learning from the kids in an Akanksha classroom, now in a Teach for India classroom, along with our fellows, um, is really, really helpful to the teachers because you're able to give a lot of individual attention to the kids, um, but also as the way in which you'll possibly get um, as much as you can. And the second bucket is the sort of broader bucket of resources. I think all of our under our classrooms are really under-resourced. So thinking about how you can collect books and aids and make things which can actually be used for teaching, I think that would be really helpful. Great. Thank you very Thanks. much.